In this video, we're going to be working out if Brexit has well and truly fucked the UK economy. And the more I dug into this, the more complicated the answer got, and I arrived at a conclusion which you might not necessarily expect. Now, ideological imbeciles will say that this is a hit job against Brexit, or that I'm pro-Brexit. That is absolutely not what this is. This is a completely quantitative judgement of the UK economy pre and post Brexit. This is the third video in our UK economy series. Links for the other two will be at the end of the video. Let's get into it. GDP. One thing that we have found is that the growth forecasts for the UK have been consistently cut. The original forecast for 2024 and 2025 was 1.8 and 2.5%, but that's now been cut to 0.7% and 1.4%. But a report from the Nas National Institute of Economic and Social Research found that, and this number tends to vary, but that UK GDP is between 2 and 4% below where it, where it would have otherwise been. Now, that might not sound like a great deal, but when you're talking about trillions it can start to make a pretty big difference. And this corresponds to a per capita change in GDP of about £850 over the space of a couple of years. The more concerning part of this analysis for me is that it indicates that this is a gap that's only going to get wider. And so by the time we get to 2035, that gap might be between 5 and 6%, which is a per capita GDP decrease of £2,300 a year. And this fall in GDP will ultimately mean that there's a fall in real incomes as well. And the analysis splits this decline into two parts. The first is change in trade, and then the second is fall in productivity. And productivity is something we talked about in the previous video, where, and this is something where the UK used to be pretty good at pre-financial crisis, but since then has really struggled. So this is kind of a hammer blow on top of a hammer blow. Weaker business investment. A study from the Centre of Economic Policy and Research estimates that the loss of investment to the UK economy as a result of Brexit is around 300 billion pounds. And again, one of the things we talked about in the previous video is Again, this is just something where the UK has really lagged, so it's sort of kicking while they're down kind of situation. Now, this overall investment can also be tied to the kind of decline in productivity, which we'll dive into a bit more detail further on. But it's really something that the UK should be doing much better at, but has consistently started to struggle with. Some estimates say that the UK trade intensity with the EU has fallen by about 10%. And the OBR has noted that trade intensity, which is kind of trade as a proportion of GDP has fallen kind of significantly in other areas as well as with other economies. The UK is a predominantly services-based economy and the reason why trade is kind of important is that it doesn't matter which country you are, basically every country on earth trades with its nearest partners the most. The, U the US its biggest trading partners are Canada and Mexico, the UK's biggest trading partners were the EU and that's because the per mile distance to ship a good or a product is going to increase the further away you travel. It's much more expensive for me to send something to China than it is to send something just down the road. This means that it makes more financial sense, more economic sense to trade with the people who are closest to you. Now, the UK, it had been assumed that because we were a predominantly services-based economy that we would be more insulated from this effect, but actually it transpires that that effect still holds. And I think one other thing that we should hit on slightly is one of the things we talked about again in the previous video was the discussion about regional inequality. And the UK has continued to attract some decent chunks of foreign investment, but we should be really specific here and say, for a lot of that, it is going to London. It is people taking advantage of the weak pound and using it as an opportunity to invest in property or to buy up land or to buy up assets that are denominated in pounds. And that masks a much, I think, more downward facing, let's call it, trajectory. So London, as is often the case, masks some much more underlying problems that the rest of the UK is ultimately facing. Reduced productivity. A study by the Centre for Research on Socioeconomic Change estimates that by leaving the EU, the UK's productivity growth has slowed by about half a percentage point when compared with having stayed within the EU. And the OBR put, published this in one of their reports. It says, the introduction of the trade and cooperation agreement will reduce long run productivity by 4% relative to remaining within the EU. This largely reflects our view that increase in non-tariff barriers for, on UK EU trade acts as an additional impediment to the exploitation of comparative advantage. Now, every country has its own comparative advantage and it's basically something which a particular country or economy has an advantage in producing. For example, if you are a country that has lots of woodland and lots of trees, you will probably be pretty decent at producing handmade wooden furniture, as a very rough example. As we talked about with productivity is, if you look at this chart, one of the benefits of productivity is that it leads to real wage growth, and that's ultimately because you can afford to pay people more because they are producing more. But if your productivity is flatlined, the only way you can 
basically increase your output is to have people work longer hours, which has been the case, or to have more people come into the UK and have more people working at the same level of output. And again, historically, those workers have come traditionally from the EU. Increased labour shortages. This was something that really kind of kicked off over COVID, but has got worse post-Brexit. And one of the things that we find is that this is a really unequal distribution. So by the UK and agricultural lobby group's own estimates, they need about 70 to 80,000 seasonal workers in order to pick a lot of the fruit and vegetables that we grow in the UK. But the problem that we invariably run into is that a lot of those workers would come from the EU on a seasonal visa and then go back at the end of the uh, picking season. But a lot of those workers just can't get there and the government has only released, uh, I think it's between 30 and 40,000 of those visas. So we end up in this situation where the UK is ultimately paying higher prices for its domestically produced food because it's having to pay greater labour costs in order to secure and pick that food. And some of the other areas in the economy where this has particularly been a problem are kind of agriculture, food production, hospitality and healthcare. Increased uncertainty. I think it's fair to say that the UK, and this is borne out largely by polling data, the UK has lost its stalwart reputation of being a sturdy country to do business in. And that's largely because of the chaos of the Brexit period post the 2016 vote up until the point where the TCA was signed there was so much brinkmanship that it was just made the UK a less attractive place to want to invest your money and this is ultimately a problem which the UK has kind of faced and there's been some recent good news in this area a lot of Japanese car manufacturers would were sort of lured to the UK to set up production facilities on the basis of access to the single market so if that ceases to be the case in the event of a no-deal Brexit, had that transpired, then that would have been problematic for those Japanese car manufacturers. So they, a lot of them held off investment. Now, post-TCA, some of them have renewed that investment. But the question, as is the case with a lot of this, will be what would they have done had we remained in the EU? Now, clearly, Occam's razor applies. And the British Chamber of Commerce did a survey and found that Brexit uncertainty was one of the primary reasons preventing more companies from investing in the UK. Reduced inward investment. This is investment coming from abroad into the UK. And a study by EY Financial Services found that this foreign direct investment has fallen by about 23%, which is catastrophic for some of the other parts of the UK. Lower business investment. The UK had a sort of post-financial crisis, had kind of a paltry showing in this area, if we're completely honest. It has not done very well when it comes to investment. And that's basically a combination of a reduction in private investment, but almost more importantly, a reduction in public investment, with the UK government trying desperately to cut as much capital expenditure as it possibly could in order to facilitate reducing the nation's overall GDP. A story which has not gone that well, if we're totally honest. But another report from the OBR has found that even post-2016, there's been a further decline in investment with around 10%, which, you know, can't blame that on the financial crisis. And that will lead to a reduction in productivity and therefore a reduction in GDP output of around 1%. So again, you start adding these 3 4% here, this 1% here, it starts to add up to an increasingly dire picture for the UK economy. So when we add all of these variables together, what's the conclusion we kind of arrive at? I think there are kind of a couple of inescapable conclusions that you can't help but draw. The first is that the UK was an economy that was, for the most part, already struggling, falling consistently behind OECD, G7, G20 countries, uh, other comparable rich nations, we were not doing that great. Um, that's one of the things we talked about in the previous video, link will be at the end, or just here, where we just never really got back onto our feet after the financial crisis. You could argue that that's because of the size, the outweighted size of the financial sector when compared to the rest of the economy. There are a whole host of possible solutions and possible explanations there. But Brexit was the thing that really kind of kneecapped us. We were in a situation where we weren't doing that great, but actually a lot of the statistics have gone from kind of flatlining to starting to actively decline. Another variable which I don't think we can reasonably escape from is that there's been this unbelievably unequal effect of Brexit. Some industries have been hit much harder than others. Fishing, food production, hospitality, healthcare have all been much harder hit. And on the theme of unequal outcomes, I think it's also fair to say that small businesses have been absolutely clobbered by Brexit. A lot of the red tape that we didn't have to worry about when it came to the custom, us being in the customs union and the single market, if you're a huge multinational firm with thousands of employees, then a couple of extra people to help handle that paperwork, no fuss, no muss, no big deal. 
But if you're a small trader, maybe there's only a few of you, actually exporting to the EU is now much harder than it used to be. So I think there are lots of unequal outcomes here. Another thing which we can't escape from is that a lot of these trade deals, which you know we were promised, 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 were have just not come to pass. Joe, but President Joe Biden has already made it clear that signing a trade deal with the UK is not one of his top priorities. And a lot of the deals that we've signed to date have been pretty negligible. The ones with Australia and New Zealand, for example, do not even come close to offsetting the estimated damage that has been done to the UK economy as a result of leaving the EU. And ultimately this is borne out by the data as well. Two thirds of voters think that Brexit has damaged the economy. And even among Leave voters, only around one in four or in some cases one in five Leave voters actually think that the effects of Brexit have been positive. Thanks very much for watching. If you've liked this video, please like and subscribe. Peace out.